Thanks, Nick. Thanks, and uh, great to be in Adelaide. The world operates on an emotional level, not on a rational level. So we are all well-educated. Um, we read. We understand what goes on in the world. We like to think that we're rational. None of us are rational. Um, you've really got to be on the spectrum, quite far out, not to you know, not to be influenced by emotion. That's me stigmatizing people on the spectrum, for which I apologize. But nonetheless, the kind of norm is that you respond to the world emotionally, and. A lot of that is about what Nick was talking about, which is, well, what does it, we, you can go in with 44 different measures and meet them on your standards and people will still be unhappy. So wh what's going on there? And you know, it's a frustration in the healthcare system. Somebody comes in, somebody comes in perhaps that, who's a client of yours at home, they go into hospital, they have stuff done, and they go home, and you, the, the doctors are frustrated because they've done everything right, and the person is still unwell, unhappy, and actually sometimes never gets better. What is going on here? And it's just that we miss this bit about the power of emotion. A couple of books I'm going to talk about today that I recommend that you, uh, that you read. One is a book by Dan Kahneman, who's a Nobel laureate in uh, economics. Um, but he's not an economist. I'm actually not sure how much he knows about economics, but he won the Nobel Prize in economics because he's a psychologist. And the book's called Fast Thinking, Slow Thinking. And what, why he won the Nobel Prize in economics was for his work on perception of risk. In fact, most of his work has been in health uh, and to some extent in aging, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And he's, so what he, what he uh, and the relevance to investment is that we're all, that we tend to be risk averse. If we think we're gonna lose something, we get very emotionally charged. And if you've got your superannuation in a fund with somebody who's really risk averse, they're never gonna make any money for you because they'll react perversely to risk. Um, the carry pa so we respond more to the negative than the positive. That's one reason why complaints are very important in, a, in any sort of system. But we react more to negative things around us than positive things. Just think about the difference. You're walking down the street and uh, you see a $50 bill and you pick it up. How happy do you feel? And you're walking, into a sh you're walking down the street, it's a different situation, and you go into your purse or wallet and you knew you had $50 there to pay for the bill and the $50 is gone. It's the, same, it's the same situation. It's a change in your world of $50. But the gain gives you less, less emotional change than the loss. The agony of loss is much greater than the pressure of gain. And that's just a general thing. And it's how we survived evolution. You weren't going to, you weren't going to survive you know, in the hunter-gatherer world by walking through the savanna grassland with your, with your partner and your family group and uh, the sun's shining and uh, you, there's a rustle in the grass. Which is the more survive, best survival? Darling, isn't it a wonderful day? The sun's shining and the wind's blowing in the grass or shit, there's a tiger there, let's run. <laughs> we survive by the negative. Emotion is, impor is, is really important. Fast thinking, slow thinking. And we respond to things very, very quickly. So we make decisions just like that every day of the week. And luckily, most of them are right. The trouble is when some of them are really important and they're influenced by emotion. So if there's, a negative, if there's something negative around there, that wormhole through our brain to make a, a nanosecond decision is, you know, tends to influence us and dominate because we've survived. And that influences our world and our perception. So just, I don't want to be negative as a sense, but the negative does drive. And it's why you sometimes get perplexed where you think you've done everything right. And yet emotion dominates. And no amount of rational discussion will actually change that situation. And so what uh, Kahneman talks about and why, coming back to why he won the Nobel Prize was if you're, an if you're an investor, you're running a self, your own self-managed super fund, and you respond to the negative, you will not invest rationally. So what, um, what 
what the Kerry Packers do in this world is that, or the, not the Jamie Packers necessarily in these days, but the, the, what Packer you know, was famous for was that he bought shares on a falling market and sold them on a rising market, which is exactly the opposite of what I do. I don't know about you, because we follow the herd. It's going up. We must jump on the bandwagon at going up, and, it's, and then we panic when it's falling, and we must sell too. And so contrarian investment does the opposite. And that's actually simply, over simply, what Cameron won the Nobel Prize for, the, the, the psychology behind contrarian investment. But it actually dominates our lives. Uh, this business of fast thinking and slow thinking. And that's the trap, of course, also with safety. I know that's been a recurrent theme, the minister, Nick, because uh, the other book that I'll recommend to you is On Being Mortal by Atul Gawande, G-A-W-A-N-D-E. And if you want to hear a bit about him, you can go to my health report uh, website and look for uh, the podcast, which I think was in June, of um, an interview I did with him in front of a live audience at the Sydney Opera House. 2,000 people came to see, hear him, not me, him, uh, I was interviewing him, uh, it was sold out within 24 hours of it going on sale at the Sydney Writers Festival. 24 hours, 2,000 people, on being mortal, about largely ageing and aged care. This is, this is a book about your business. It is essential reading. 2,000 people came to hear him about your business and sold out the tickets within 24 hours. If that's not a message about your business, I don't know what is. So what were the messages of Gawande? His message was even more blunt. The minister's got to be careful. Nick's got to be careful. His message was, what actually destroys this injury, in this industry, is the focus on safety. Kids, when they're putting their, their elderly parent, and, and, and I, I, I think I know a bit about aged care, and I understand there's been a fantastic move towards home-based care, keeping people at home as long as possible. And that's hard work, and it's messy work in a sense that you've got to go with what's there, and it's probably a reason why some of the compliance is a bit lower, because it's actually really tough work. But when he talks about residential care, he says what kills it is safety. So when kids want their parents to go, there's all sorts of reasons why kids want their parents to go into residential care. Some good, some not so good. But what they want, in many kids, is the kids, their parents to be safe. They're worried about wandering, accidents at home. They're going to be much safer if they're in a home. And you feel that that's your responsibility. What if something terrible would happen? His dominant argument in that book is safety remove, that focus on safety removes autonomy. He describes very amusingly, um, so, he, so there's, um, he describes uh, some residential aged care, and there are some examples of this in Australia, where people are organized into pods, which where you have your own room, you're not having to share with somebody you don't know, um, and you're, you recreate the control of daily life, where you've got your own fridge, your own kitchen, uh, you can go to the movies with your carer and so on. But then the question is, what do you leave in the fridge if somebody's not swallowing properly? And, uh, and if they've got diabetes, you're going to keep, you know, what sort of food are you going to have in the fridge? And Gawande says, well, you know, let them eat what they want. How bad, you know, if, if they're going to be you know, happy and they have a little choking episode, so they have a little choking episode. Um, if they're going to have, if, what, how much risk is it going out to the movies with your carer if, you've got, if you're lucky enough to have the resources to be able to do that? In other words, autonomy is what's incredibly important. And I want to just talk a little bit about the science behind this. Because this can sound like soft, namby-pamby, nice-to-have stuff. Well, of course, it's easy, well, first of all, it's easy to think about the client as somebody over there rather than thinking about ourselves. Is that one of the things that we cherish about our own lives is that ability to make decisions about our own lives and that freedom. 
I can decide. Am I going to the movies tonight, if, I, if I'm lucky enough to have the resources to do it, or I've got a babysitter, or what have you? Um, I can choose what I eat. The autonomy is the core of what we do. And this actually has a lot of evidence around it in terms of how well we feel about ourselves and the world. Not only that, it actually determines the illnesses we get, how long we live. Let me describe some of the research in this area. So, so this, this can feel soft. It's not. This is hard science. There's no, there's no question about this in the, in the scientific literature. So one of the pioneers in the work in this area is um, Sir Michael Marmot. He's actually an Australian. He lives, he's lived and worked for most of his career, trained in Sydney, but lived for most of his career in uh, London, at University College London. And he was the inheritor of a study called the Whitehall Study. And this has followed, or followed the health, there's been two of them, followed the health of civil servants in the British Civil Service. I don't know how many of you remember Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister on television. And the British Civil Service is incredibly hierarchical. From the Mandarins, the Sir Humphreys of this world, for those of you who've never seen the series, Sir Humphrey was the head of department, the secretary of the department. So the, the you know, hierarchical down to the person who sweeps the floor. So they follow the health, and, and, and you could follow these people by their hierarchy through life. And that's what this study did. And what they showed, and you, well, unsurprisingly, I suppose you'd say, is that there was an absolute relationship between where you were on the hierarchy and how long you lived, what diseases you got and when, mental health, anything you looked at, there was a gradation of the hierarchy. The Sir Humphreys were much better off than the people at the bottom of the scale. So the question is, and that's true throughout life. You, know, you look at um, socioeconomic status, it's true and so on, but it was typified in this group where they were able to follow them, follow them really accurately. So what was it that made the difference? So was it that the Sir Humphreys didn't smoke and the people sweeping the floors did? Well, that made a difference. There were lifestyle differences between top and bottom. But when you took out statistically all, well, what would have happened is if it was lifestyle and you took them out statistically, there would be a flat line. Everybody would be equal. But in fact, it wasn't a flat line. So when you took out the lifestyle differences between top and bottom, there was still a gradient between top and bottom. So is it education, or is it use of health services? The Sir Humphreys could afford to go to you know, the, the, the London clinic versus having to go to um, a badly run NHS hospital. No, the, the made almost no difference in terms of the use of health services. Still a line. Was it their level of education? Well, yes, that did make a difference. Because interestingly, your level of education um, is one of the strongest predictors of how well you do in life, independent of how much you earn. So if you line up two people who smoke the same number of cigarettes a day, the person with a big, longer education will live longer. The person with a longer education will get dementia later in life because you store up more brain power earlier in life than you decline later. Education is one of the strongest predictors of uh, mortality and everything else, um, and uh, it, it's very important. But even with, and in fact, the Gonski reforms that we were talking, that were in the, being debated over the last couple of years in, in education, are not about education. They're about the health and well-being of Australians. The better we educate our children, the healthier Australia. Not about health education. The healthier and more well we will feel. Cutting long story short. You could remove everything you think of, and there still was a gradient. What Marmot did was he factored in something called control. control for those of you who've done psychology, control is it was called it's locus of control. It's how much latitude do you have at work and in life to make decisions, to make decisions about your life and work, and how much pressure do you feel under. And the people who with the low, and once you factored in a sense of control and locus of control into that gradient, it flattened out. So one of the key and most important factors in determining well-being, how long you lived, was that locus of control. Call it autonomy, call it what you like, but it was control. Incredibly important. 
So this is people in the middle of the British civil service who are being told what to do and being pushed around and don't, you know, their lives are totally prescribed. And it could be a single parent with three kids who's on a pension and life is just too much uh, for them and they are totally out of control. They haven't got a boss telling them what to do but life circumstances takes away control. It's also what happens in Aboriginal communities where um, you know, they've been dislocated and fragmented, um, where kids have been taken away from their parents generationally, no recognition of land. You know, these, this, that, you know, we hear Aboriginal people talking about this story and don't realize that, that this is hardcore science. What's been done to Aboriginal people in this country absolutely goes you know, in line with the science. Loss of control and lives are lost prematurely. And then it's a disintegrating spiral because as the West Australian Child Health, Aboriginal Child Health Study has shown, you've got children growing up in families where parents die at 50 and you, ha you have no continuity of parenting simply because people die and this loss of control. What's this got to do with you? Well, of course, it's got a huge amount to do with you because we're talking about the importance of autonomy and control. And interestingly, a guy called, a researcher called Len Syme at the University of California, Berkeley, has taken this one step further because he has argued Oh, so but just let me finish off on the Aboriginal community story. And of course, what have Aboriginal communities done is the successful ones have taken back control. So what do we call Aboriginal medical services? We actually don't, we call them Aboriginal medical services. Aboriginal communities call them community controlled organizations. They're the bosses, they control it. They tell the doctors, the physiotherapists, the nurses what to do. And there are some incredibly powerful and successful community controlled organizations. Len Syme took this further at University of California, Berkeley. This is really important research. He disagreed with Michael Marmot. They're friends, but they disagreed with Michael Marmot. He thought it was more than control. He said, there's still a gradient. If, he, when you actually look at it, it, fl it flattened out a lot when you removed control, but it didn't flat out, flatten out completely. So what gave you this flat? He reckoned it was something called self-efficacy. So he did a study looking at what, what actually deep down happens when, you, um, when you've lost that control. And it's the, it is this ability to make decisions and actually do something about your lives. And be, because we tend to think about, we tend to think focus on poverty when you're looking at things like this, but it's not just about poverty. It's other situations as well. So what he found was that people in that situation where they lost control lose the ability to do things about their lives. So he showed single women with kids in the Berkeley, in the Bay Area of California, San Francisco, when they were looking for social support and they had to go into one of those dial one for this, dial two for that, dial three for that, they didn't even, they hung up the phone. They weren't, it wasn't that they were incapable of doing it, it was just one step too far. When you look at people who've gone through cancer care, very quickly in cancer care, people lose this self-efficacy. People who might have PhDs, be chief executives of companies, they lose this self-efficacy as well, this ability to make decisions. It makes people sick, either sick mentally and psychologically or sick physically. So this control factor, this self-efficacy is not a nice to have. It's not a nice to have. It's core to our being. Most of us in this room have it. The people that you care for and serve, they have had it in the past. And they remember it. Even when they've got dementia, they remember it. They might not be able to articulate it, but they remember it. We don't really know why people wander. We speculate, but they're looking for something. So this idea of consumer-driven care, easy to say, bloody hard to do. It's a struggle for all of you. Um, 
you know, talking about Radio National. So I ran Radio National in the in the early 90s, where Radio National was sort of dying, was losing. We, we, the audience was so old, our audience was declining at the death rate of Australians. <laughs> and I'd been there for a while, and I was always interested in management, so I came in to run Radio National and to revive it. And what I actually had to do was, we had broadcasters who had never thought about the audience whatsoever. There was a program on a Sunday night on Radio National called Radio Helicon cost a fortune, three hours of impenetrable radio on Goethe, or, and I, say, I don't call Goethe in sort of throwing that away, or Dante, uh, really interesting topics, but they killed them, you know, they absolutely murdered them. And so I, I, so I said to, and I, and I hired people like Wendy Harmer, I gave Wendy Harmer her first job in radio, and she had a great program at half past five every, for drive, just half an hour. And um, the woman who produced her now produces um, that Chris uh, Lilly. She does um, a film. Has got a film company now. Does the Chris Lilly? But anyway, Wendy did things like interview a ventriloquist on air. Um, you know, stuff like really mad stuff. Anyway, I did this. I, had, I went down for a staff one of these terrible staff consultations in uh, in Melbourne, and I was just getting broadcasters to be focused on the audience, for God's sake. I said, it's not that I don't want to make a program about Goethe, I just love to make a program about Goethe that people would actually listen to. And this producer, this Radio Helicon producer, said in the middle of this large staff meeting, but I thought we were the last place in the ABC which had to think about the audience. And Wendy Harmer sort of fell, literally fell off her chair, lay on the ground and kicked her heels on the ground. So it's not just aged care, it's everywhere top to bottom, side to side. And luckily in radio, people got the option, it's just an easy option, we just turn it off and go somewhere else. We don't have to listen to that. So you, but for people in, who you serve, they don't have options. Um, and your job is to give them options, to give them choice. In an environment which is resource constrained, where expectations can be too high, but they still want their options. And what do you do? What corners do you cut in order to give them? And does that, those corners cut? Do they reduce your compliance here but gain you that extra level of quality? How do you ensure things like safety? Because you don't want people to be in dangerous circumstances and you're not going to be forgiven by, for the, you know, the, the, the person who fractures their hip. But how do you balance that out? It's a problem for the people who accredit you and it's a problem for you too. But it's a challenge more than a problem. And it's about care, and it's about attention, and it's about listening. Because the other part of what uh, Gawande talks about in being mortal is that he talks, so uh, I apologize for being a bit clinical. I'm going for time. Uh, I apologize for being a bit clinical, but he talks about three, t three different types of doctor. Uh, but I think it applies to most professionals, actually. Um, Thanks. So he talks about three different types of doctor. The old-fashioned doctor says, I know what's good for you. Just listen to me. Trust me, I know what's good for you. There's the more modern doctor who says, who think, who's worried about autonomy and says, um, you know, here's all the information, um, scary or not, but I'm just laying it on the table for you, and you make the decision, you make the decision based on this. It's your choice, respecting autonomy. And he argues there's a third kind of doctor, and I would say there's a third kind of professional, which says, which starts from a very different place, and starts from the place where a lot of you start from, particularly those of you who work in home in the community. But increasingly, it should be in aged care as well, and it should be the architects who design your, your, your facilities and the business managers who work out how you make them survive financially. And it's about, tell me what you want. Tell me what your expectations are. Tell me what your goals are. Let's work on this and see how we can achieve it. So when you say you want to stay at home, and there, what's the sort of things that you want to do? What are the things that you value? Is it meeting with your friends? Is it being able to attend your kids' 
and grandkids and great grandkids' uh, birthday parties? Is it being around you know, the medical context? Is it being around till Christmas so that something important is happening at Christmas? What are your goals here? And some of them will be, will be unrealistic. And that you share goal setting with your clients and patients. And then the professional says, well, look, I haven't got magic in my kit bag. I can't suddenly make you walk and run the way you did 30 years ago. But I've got these, I've got, uh, this is what I've got in my tool bag for you that could help. Let's just see what works and what doesn't work. And those of you who are doing the job well will be doing that already. And that's what, Go, you know, and that's what Gowandi argues for. And what does that do? Let's come right back to the beginning and talk about emotion. So rationally, in a rational world, you fulfill the 44 or so requirements that you're required to fill. And rationally, you can argue that, and you're this great facility. But you could have some very unhappy clients, because there's no system of accreditation that will really come down to preference experience. You can do patient experience or client experience surveys and so on, but you really need to take a deep dive into that. It's about preference, it's about choice, it's about autonomy. And if you're providing that, a lot of the other things are actually going to be pretty good too. So how, you know, you are going to find your, you have to find your own way through that. Um, walking a mile in other people's shoes, all the things that you try already. I mean, one of the things, for example, I've often wondered about in residential aged care is what, you know, what they call reablement. Why is it always considered a one-way street? Why is this the end of the road, residential-based care? Why does it have to be that? It doesn't have to be a step. Yes, there, you know, there's sometimes a stepwise decline, but people can go through stabilization and go back. Maria Fiataroni Singh, who used to be at Tufts and is now in Sydney, I mean, she did work with frail 90-year-olds, gave them weight training, and found that you could actually re-strengthen them and give them some empowerment. I'm not sure how many went home, probably not many, but they were happier and more able to do stuff for themselves. It's very easy to take a nihilistic approach. What if our view was about somebody, even in the best designed aged care facility, what if our objective was to try and get, you know, if their aim was to get home, why don't we work towards that? What would we have to put in? What physical strengthening would we have to do? What training? How would that change the way you do stuff in residential care if everybody, if we stop thinking of it as this is where you've come to die. We really think hard about what it means to be a home, a home, not, not a home, you know what I mean, and, but that it's actually maybe just a temporary place to be that you actually might get back without creating unrealistic expectations for people with you know, really quite profound dementia. These are all tough questions which change the way we do business challenge some of our assumptions and create different worlds which don't exist at the moment. We heard Frank earlier um, giving us a welcome to country. That's, what, that's the strength in Aboriginal communities. They've, they've come through incredible fragmentation and those which are successful are those that come together as communities. And that's why a lot of the faith-based services I think work well, work well. Some don't. Some are pretty shaky, but many do because they are connected to real communities. So autonomy, control, choice, they're non-negotiable. Thank you very much.